Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Archives of American Arts Unboxed Lunch. Before we get started, I want to let you know that this is being recorded. My name is Nora, and we're thrilled you're joining us for lunch, which I'm enjoying here in Tacoma Park, Maryland, and the Archives National Collector Josh Franco is enjoying from his office in the Archives in downtown Washington. Today's event is all about the records of abstract expressionist and abstract, abstract expressionist painter and sculptor Nella Arias Masson, which Josh will be diving into with all of you in just a few minutes. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. At any time during the webinar, you can submit your questions for Josh, which I will read to him as he uncovers materials from the collection. To submit a question, just type it into the Q&A at the bottom of the control panel on your screen. And now I'd like to introduce Josh Franco, National Collector at the Archives of American Art. Hi, Nora. Hi, everybody. Uh, glad to be here for another Unbox Lunch. Um, I'm just going to dive right in. I was telling Nora the other day, the feeling of this is familiar, and I realized it's because often when people are in the office, there's not a lot of us here right now. Um, people would just stop by, see the door open, see boxes, and then come in and ask what's going on. So um, welcome to kind of our day here. So today I'm really happy to be talking about the papers of Nella Arias Misson. They arrived officially at the archives, this first installment in December, um, but this has been in the works since about 2016. And perhaps even before that, um, Nella has been associated with a lot of mystic powers, and I think that's warranted, as you'll see. Um, Nella Arias Musson was born in Cuba, lived much of her life in New York City, in Brussels, um, in Spain, and the end of her life in Miami. Uh, she was born in 1915 and passed away in 2015, so a neat 100 years. Um, so I'll show you, just to give you a bit of our insight into the archival process, so they have been moved into an official archival box. This is one linear foot, that's the label. Our registrar has placed them on the shelves, given them their barcode went to the shelf location this morning to pick them up. Um, and the deed has been signed by the donors who I'll tell you more about, but they are, so they are accessible to researchers um, now currently, if, if not for COVID, you can make an appointment and come in and see them, but they are still in their unprocessed collection. So in a, within about a year, maybe two years, this is small. So I think it's easy to say within a year, um, they will be processed. And I'll show you what process looks like in a moment, but I wanna start with um, Nella herself first. So right now the sort of raw form relative to the archives is these binders that the donors made them in. Uh, the donors are Flor Mayral and Marcelo Yobel, who are the co-founders of the, the Doral Contemporary Art Museum um, in Miami or in Doral, Florida, outside Miami. Uh, they've done an incredible job. I know my first unbox was also a very meticulously organized collection as is this one. Um, I'm giving you the wrong impression. We most of our collections come in not in this in this format, um, but we you know consider that's not a bar to consideration how they're organized. But these are exceptional. So each document is in this binder, um, and each single document has its own sheet of documentation uh, created by Flood and Marcelo themselves. So it gives you the basic what we would call the metadata. So our archivists are probably very happy seeing that on screen now. I know a few of them are watching. So it'll be very helpful to their work. So this first um, document, I'll start out so we can see Nella. Let me wait till that gets clear on the camera. Maybe that text will clear up. This is her passport from 1964. Um, if the text would clear up, you would see her address is Perry Street. She's living in New York at this point. Um, living a very fabulous life. I hope I expectfully expect books and articles to come out of this collection. Um, and we're happy to facilitate that. So she's living in New York, you know, for at least 20 years at this point. And that's her passport to go to Columbia uh, on this particular trip. And a picture of her. She had moved to New York in the early 1940s um, for family. Her mother and grandmother were there, but also to study at the Art Student League. Uh, and that's just the first of many connections you'll see to um, places that have proven themselves as important nodes in the history of American art and that we have much documentation of uh, throughout other collections of participants in the Art Student League. 
And I want to show you a letter. And then we'll show you some images of her art. But correspondence is, of course, much of the archive's bread and butter. Uh, we love when we get correspondence that we have the senders of, or you know, correspondence is always in halves, and it's nice to complete those. Or just to see letters from other people that are familiar known names in the archives and in American art like Mark Rothko. Uh, so as Nora described, abstract expressionism is one of those you know, academically defined realms of um, painting and art making and sculpture making that Nella uh, can certainly be framed in as far as both the style when you look at her art, but also the characters in her life who she interacted with and the places she went um, to look at art, make art and show art. So uh, Mark Rothko crossed paths with Nella and her husband at the time, Alain Misson. Um, and they, uh, you know, as we do now, or perhaps as we miss doing this year, um, were involved in helping each other find places to stay in New York City and other places, and they uh, had a kind of a nice friendship. Um, Roth, correspondence from Rothko shows up in many other collections in the archives, of course. And I would just say, sort of one of the nice observations I've been able to make um, seeing that correspondence is I've really come to think of Rothko as a writer. Uh, of course, he's a great painter, but a really beautiful writer. And seeking out his letters here is uh, something I recommend doing. So I won't go into reading this one too much, but I do just want to show you the words are beautiful, but also the handwriting's really nice. Um, I like getting close to people's handwriting through their archival materials. And here, you know, my best to both of you in friendship, Mark Rothko. You can see a signature there. Um, so that's great to see. And there's much more correspondence and documentation in here. And um, yeah, I want to go show you some images of her art so you can sort of see, you know, what scholars and people are saying when they put her in abstract expressionist camp. Nora. You have a question. Um, sure. At least I have a question, and that is, and if folks have questions, you can put them into the chat or into the Q and A. Um, and I'm wondering about what other collections of Latinx artists um, or art figures we have at the archives. If we could highlight some of those, I know we have some friends from the Smithsonian, sure, um, uh, Latino um, Center on the call today. Yeah, I think um, it's so interesting that you use the term Latinx as I would probably too uh, for, to describe Nella at some point in kind of casual conversation. I think it's important. This is something we thought through, through the Archives of American Art Journal and other places we have to think about, you know, our consistent writing style. Um, I think Latinx is not a way that officially if I were writing about her for a scholarly journal or anything, I would describe Nella only because it's um, not a term that existed when she was alive. Uh, and even Latina is interesting because of her sort of, um, well, the, you know, it raises questions about regionality, globality, because she did live so much of her life in Europe. Uh, would she have thought herself that way? So I think it's uh, a logical way to think of her as we're thinking as scholars and users of archives in 2021, um, keeping in mind that um, that grain of salt should be there. But I think, but to your to your question, actually. Uh, this is a great compliment to the papers of Maria Luisa Pacheco, um, great Frida Kahlo, <laughs> I have a nice connection to make for you all soon. Uh, she, um, uh, you know, is in this group of women, Agnes Pelton, we also have the Agnes Pelton papers. Um, so it's less about the country of origin, although I think that's important um, when you see her in company with Maria Luisa Pacheco, Frida Kahlo and others. Uh, but also in the sort of mystic abstraction, abstractionist painting style um, of Agnes Pelton, uh, Hilma Ofklimt. I don't know that we have any Hilma Ofklimt material in the archives. We definitely have Pelton, um, but painting style, there's certainly a relation there. And of course, uh, Hans Hoffman, who she studied with and who we have much material related to. Um, so she went to Art Student League in the 40s and eventually made her way to Hans Hoffman's painting school in Provincetown where some really remarkable moments in her artistic career happened. Um, now I wanna show you in the second binder. So the first binder is largely documents, text based, and the second binder is uh, largely photographs. And it's kind of hard to choose. Um, Nora, I think even choosing the image for this flyer for this event was tough because there's so many fabulous ones. This one's sort of just definitely a glamor shot, but there's some great photos of her working in her studio. Let me show you those. 
Show the baseball cap one too, because that one's <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she, uh, according to even her daughter, if you research Nella, there's um, Florida Marcello and others are managing her estate have really done a good job um, building a website, building uh, even the Wikipedia and getting other articles produced. Um, so you can see that and you can see even her daughter speaking in a video about how her mother was all about breaking um, conventions. So this isn't the baseball cap, but here's a great sailor suit situation. And this is Nella uh, in Cuba in 1932. I'd like to know why that wasn't given as an option for the invite. You know, there's <laughs> just too many. I'm sorry, Nora. <laughs> okay, here's a good one. So this is her, I've kind of come to identify three major movements in Nella's painting. Um, one is very closely tied to the Hoffman's teaching in years, and I think this the painting you see here would be one of those. Uh, she is a great user of color. That's not evident in this photograph. And I will say all her art is, uh, most a large portion of her art uh, is being also maintained by uh, the Dahl Contemporary Art Museum. Um, so it's been great for me. I've had, you know, I think three lengthy visits to Miami to work on these papers um, with the donors. And the art's always there, which is so nice to get to spend time with the paintings while we're sort of uh, hunkered down over file cabinets and things. Here's a great, um, another phase of her painting is these really almost low, not even low, like real sculptural relief dots made of compiled painting. Uh, that you, I don't know how much of a sense you can get of their depth on this, but that's what she's working on in this photograph. And those, there's a number of paintings of that style that are great. Josh, um, Floor came into the Q&A and, and clarified the sailor suit situation. It was a pajama party competition at the beach. That's great. And it's probably on the sheet. I'm just not stopping to read everything now. Thank you, Floor. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Floor. This has been what it's like for, for three or four years to work with Floor and Marcel, <laughs> and it's been so lovely. I'm trying to find a big color one. Ah, here's the baseball cap. Oh, and this one, it looks like in, um, there's three different kinds of annotation on the back, different inks and handwritings. So that's always interesting to think about who's doing that annotating. One says, my first day at Hoffman School. Uh, so I assume that's Nella writing because it's my. Um, so that's great. So this would be Provincetown. And there's an address on the back, but see, I, my researcher instincts kick in to look really closely, but we're not here to, to do that right now. And then finally, before I move on to um, another connection I want to make, here's Nella and Hoffman. So, uh, if you're a scholar of the 20th century in American art, Hoffman sort of an inevitable figure and name you come across frequently. Um, he was a prolific teacher. Uh, supporter of, of um, and painter himself, of course. Question, Josh. Do you know of any researchers or research that is being done um, with the papers at the moment? Yeah, I think this would be a good question to reach out to Florida Marcello with. I'm sort of focusing on my slice, but even if you just Google, you see there's already been a couple of small articles, um, often in Spanish speaking print presses and Cuban publications. Um, I think there's plans, there are certainly things already in the works for the future. Uh, so yeah, this is sort of a perfect, um, I think any grad student or scholar looking for a new project and thinks about modernism in the 20th century and uh, wants to think it hemispherically or globally, um, this is a prime sort of figure and a great, the documentation is just so great. And hopefully painting of her shows is in the works, of course. Okay, so um, one of the other things that Florida Marcella did, which is so above and beyond, thank you, but so great, uh, is produce this great um, timeline. This is not part of the papers. This is my highlighting, This is, but this is not at all <laughs> primary source document. It's a Word doc sent as a digital file, and this is a result of um, Florida and Marcella's research. It's a super helpful year-by-year -year timeline 
uh, of NOAA's life, but interspersed with global events like world wars and, in, and beginning important, um, you know, political deaths and things like that. So it's been super, it's just a super helpful guide. It will help our processors immensely, I'm sure. Um, one of the dates that stood out to me is 1940, September 9th to, to June 30th. And 1941, Noah lives with her mother in New York uh, for six months and attends secretarial school and gets a degree as a stenographer. So that I was thinking about women painters from Latin America because I was looking at Noah and it just rang a bell with one of our um, beloved gems that we pull out a lot, but I don't think you can pull it out too much. So that year um, rang a bell. So I was confirmed. And this is also where I wanna show you what a fully processed collection looks like. So 1940, 41, hold that date in mind, which is first AM. So eventually the material in these binders will stay in the same kind of boxes, but be processed. Uh, and it will look beautiful like this in these beautifully organized folders. Um, this is <laughs> a box uh, marker that our researchers use with, in, and our reference team uses often in the reading room. Uh, so people keep things in order as they look through collections. Um, so these are the papers of Emmy Lou Packard, who is a figure you might not have heard of, um, but associated with people you almost certainly have, Diego Rivera, Rivera and Frida Kahlo. And her papers contain correspondence uh, both with them and between them. Um, besides being friends and having her own letters with them, she was also a conduit at times uh, because of being conveniently located um, in the US and being able to travel back and forth easier as a US citizen. Um, so these things ended up in her papers, which is great. So that year, 1940, reminded me to look here at the papers and be very careful. And I just want to show you this. So this is a letter from Frida Kahlo to Emily Lou Packard. Um, notice the date and the location. She's writing from New York City, from Central Park uh, in 1940. And this that's just an incredible uh, coincidence. So this is like, I think a lot of my job is spinning off ideas for other people to take and turn into fully formed <laughs> articles, books, um, exhibitions. And uh, that's one. So somebody please, you know, take that up. I think that sort of coincidence of Kahlo and uh, Arias Misson in New York is, is um, significant. That's a, that um, connects to a question we have about how um, we at the archives link artists like Nella and Carmen Herrera to American art and discourse around American art generally. Yeah, um, so I'll say the deep work of connecting, I think is, is uh, really up to researchers, but of course we've made decisions about them clearly to bring them into the collection. Um, and I think one of the, I won't do the digging right now and, and waste your time, but the, you know, Nella has school ID cards um, in hers, but many artists from Latin America uh, who began, so here's a phenomenon that happened throughout the 20th century. A lot of Latin American artists um, grew up in their countries of origin until their mid 20s, 30s. It's the case with Nella. And um, then the political turmoil, political, political turmoil that happened throughout the, you know, those countries um, in their early adulthoods led to them moving to elsewhere to becoming expatriates and a lot, often in Europe and France, uh, Brussels and other places, but in New York City was a huge location as well, of course, and Washington DC I've discovered just living here. Um, so they might have had foundational uh, art making training in their countries of origin and they all come with their school ID cards. So if they made it to like their mid twenties, early twenties, they will have gone to art school in Colombia, in Uruguay, um, in Spain sometimes and uh, have that school ID card. But by the time the archives is considering them, they've spent 50 or 60 additional years um, in New York City or in Miami or in places uh, you know, it's all over the country where the Latin American diaspora folks go. Um, so, you know, by decades of activity and working in this country um, makes them clearly American, US American artists uh, and within the collecting scope of the archives. But I love those ID cards. I, you know, it's like a dream exhibition or small publication to sh because they just really drive home the porosity of the idea of American art um, and the kind of, you know, training and art history itself sort of butts up against other official histories often. I think uh, figures like Nella make that very clear case. I wanted to uh, 
let everyone know that Floor has given some more information about who's working with um, the RS Masson papers right now. He said that Ernesto Santana Zal, I'm sorry, Zaldivar, a Cuban-born writer, is writing a fictionalized novel based on her papers. Amazing. That's new to me. That's out. great. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, there's another question too about how Nella's time in various European cities might have uh, influenced her style. That's a great question. And my understanding, again, this is one of those like, I'm always working on like 80 or so cases like this. So I can't, I want to go really deep in every one, but can't. But my general understanding um, or impression I've gotten is that Europe is also where she really crossed over into literary circles through her, um, at the, you know, at one time husband, Alain Misson, uh, Antonio Tapies in Europe, um, and others. She really was involved in sort of um, the avant garde. Uh, of literature production there. So that's an interesting angle um, uh, as well. Uh, as far as how it affects her painting, that's an interesting question. She also, I mean, clearly, you know, she's working in modernist languages and playing with that, but it's very unique style. And I can say that after a few years of being able to be up close with the work a few times uh, and for a number of hours. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always tricky to give style a region, right? Um, but I think it's important I, yeah, I look forward to a researcher fleshing out that question. I'm not going anywhere else with it at the moment. I'm just going to look for another good document while uh, waiting for a question here. Oh, these. So here's a certificate of marriage. Uh, I'm sure this will be involved in the in the fiction novel. I'm looking forward. Uh, you know, a few marriages. Nell had a very exciting life. Um, but these, just so you know, these would be under a series called biographical materials in our collections. That's what the processors will um, organize them as eventually. Uh, and those are always very interesting documents. Josh, there's a question about um, how you became involved in the archives. Sure. Um, I'm an art historian. That's, <laughs> I have a PhD in art history. And I say that because many of my colleagues at the archives have degrees in information science and library science. And I think the archives is unique in uh, bringing our works together because often art historians like myself are in academic positions um, and not working you know, every day hand in hand with archivists even though our work is totally indelibly tied. Um, so I just want to point that out to give you sort of a framework for here. So I wasn't expecting to be in this kind of job. There's not that many of this kind of job. It's a pretty uh, unique thing. I thought I would just be, a prof not just, I thought I'd be an art history professor somewhere. Um, but it was after being in a conference with Taina Karagol at the Portrait Gallery. Uh, now her office is just upstairs from mine. Um, yeah, just participating in the intellectual community. I was at a conference on a panel with Taina uh, she was obviously at the Smithsonian already. The job call went out for this. People, you know, we're always asking each other to spread uh, job calls to our networks. And um, I had just met Taina the month before and she thought I might be appropriate. So she sent me the call and I applied and, and it happened and that was great. So I've learned, sort of learned what this job was on the spot. The person who, um, like I said, art historians, it's, a, a, it's an issue in our training to address and many of my peers are addressing it. Um, is to make clear to scholars the labor that goes into getting them their primary sources and their raw material. Yeah, I see there's a fan of Taina's work. Yes, thank you. Yeah. She's great. Oh, and I'll say Taina, like myself, now I'm national collector, but my first two years at the archives, I was a Latino collection specialist. And it was in that context I came to Nella's papers. Um, Taina and I were both hired through the Latino Curatorial Initiative uh, overseen by the Smithsonian Latino Center. Um, so, you know, synergy works. And I think that was a great example. I'll also say I came to this collection, the initial connections were made through the artist Teresita Fernandez, um, who's, uh, you know, Teresita, I don't know if you're watching this, is actually, you started this, you kind of sparked this relationship. Um, she, she became aware of Nella's legacy and paintings and was struck by them as I think everyone is, uh, and has family, is a family friend of Floyd and Marcelo. And, um, knew me and connected us. And then the next three years went on. Um, here's a fun annotated card from Picasso. Like I said, Nella really, um, you know, made the rounds as far as the modernist known quantities. So here's the envelope. 
This is from her time in Spain, of course. And then nothing more than Picasso and his name. <laughs> so not much of um, not much in the way of text like the Rothko letter, but still lots of information uh, on this document, locations, names. Um, the, all these kind of data points are taken into consideration when we decide something's worth preserving at the archives because uh, that's really helpful in the future. Here's a question, Josh. Mm -hmm. um, did Nella collect any work by her fellow artists? And have you been able to identify works by other artists in photos from her studios or oh, and or homes? That's such a good question that I don't think has even really come up. Um, because I would have, I would be answering that question from the angle of the papers, and I haven't seen like per, you know receipts from galleries. I haven't seen things like that. Of course, not everything's in yet. I should say too, this is just the beginning. There's a lot more, um, and Flo and Marcelo are working through those things. So this, these two binders are amazing, and just the beginning, which is so great. Um, but that's a good question. I'm sure, as all artists, she ended up with some from friends. Floor says, I don't think she did. Yeah, <laughs> she might not. <laughs> Thanks, Floyd. I mean, there's no evidence. So, yeah. yeah. If anyone has any um, questions or comments um, before we finish up, we'd love to hear them. There is a question. There was a question earlier about um, accessioning. Um, so, where this, where the papers would go, essentially after, directly after you're like with the stage they are in right now. Yeah, so like I said, the data has been signed and they've been um, accessioned. So, and they have their shelf location. So they'll go back in storage. We're really lucky at the archives to have our storage on the same site where we work every day. So our reading room is here, our offices are here and our storage is here, um, split between two floors of this building. And um, what is the, I, I could tell you their shelf location, it won't mean anything to you, but I think it's a uh, 7E3. Um, so they'll go back to that spot as soon as this is over, put them back in their secure climate control place. Um, and then within some time, we usually say a year to two years, right now it's that with an asterisk COVID pending, um, an archivist will get to them um, and make them, you know, further organized. And this is not just to organize them physically, but they will also produce the finding aid. And the finding aid is essentially a table of contents for the papers. One of the great things about a finding aid, especially now, is that that enables digitization on demand. So in the future, when the finding aid of Nella's papers are online, anyone can go and for a fee of $37.50, request any individual folder to be digit, you know, digitized. You receive a PDF copy. Uh, it makes it possible to post those reproductions on our website for the benefit of all researchers, which is amazing. And yeah, we've seen a great uptick in that during COVID, of course. And so just plug for digitization on demand and in the future, Nella will be up for it and that'll be great. Just a quick last question. And that is where can people see her work? Uh, I think you gotta go to Miami. There's a private collection in New York, but I'm not gonna name them because we didn't talk about that. Um, but I think the two main places where it exists in concentration are uh, Miami and New York. So Doral Contemporary Art Museum in Miami. Thanks, Josh. Thanks everyone for joining us too. I know there's more comments and questions um, and that's great. If you want to continue the conversation, please feel free to email me and my um, email is in the chat there and I can connect you with Josh as well. We always love hearing from folks. Um, so thanks, Josh. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, support from friends like you, the folks uh, attending right now, makes it possible for us to share collections like Aria Smithson's with curious people around the world. If you're interested in sponsoring an Unboxed Lunch, please contact me, Nora Daniels, at the uh, email that's in the chat, my colleague put in the chat a little bit ago. Um, and to support the work of our collectors and archivists like Josh, please visit aaa.si.edu slash support. Thank you again so much for joining us and have a great day. Bye-bye.